Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is Haida Gwaii, Islands at the Edge, and it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Eddie Savage. Eddie, thanks so much for being here today and bringing us such a fascinating topic. I cannot wait to hear about Haida Gwaii. Let's dive in. Well, thank you, Sunny. Thank you, everybody, for coming to my webinar. Um, I'm really, really excited to share this bit of information with you. Haida Gwaii in Canada is uh, it's an iconic destination. It was um, it was basically the 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 place of of kind of widespread national a widespread kind of national movement to protect vast regions of uh, the archipelago that is Haida Gwaii, and that was all led by um, the Council of the Haida Nation and the Haida people um, to basically kind of ensure that their their heritage sites to the south and to ensure that the kind of the vast landscape of, of pristine wilderness was protected for future generations and for um, and for Haida cultural purposes. So it's it was national news and growing up in Canada there's always kind of just like oh have you ever been to Haida Gwaii or you know when are you going to get out to Haida Gwaii kind of thing so it's it's very special um, in Canada and in 2021 I was I was able to go there on two separate sailing expeditions um, and I spent uh, yeah I spent about four weeks kind of exploring uh, the southern half of Haida Gwaii which is where um, and I was actually on the vessels that uh, for for NatHab they've just launched a new trip to Haida Gwaii, and I was on the vessels that kind of NatHab uses um, for those journeys. So pretty excited to share that with you. Anyway, so let's go to oh, of course the first click that I do doesn't work. There we go. So let's go for the presentation overview today. Um, general kind of goals for today: we're going to learn about the Haida Gwaii as a whole. Uh, we're going to learn a lot about the Haida Nation. Um, who the the Haida people are, um, and there's there's a very kind of detailed story about the conservation of of Gwaii Hanas. And so when I refer to Haida Gwaii, Haida Gwaii is basically the entirety of the island chain, and I'll show you some maps um, in just a minute. And then when I refer to Gwaii Hanas, um, Gwaii Hanas is basically the the uh, the the Natural Park Reserve, Marine Conservation Area Reserve, and Haida Heritage Site to the south. And I'll show you um, a map of that. Uh, we're also gonna touch in on the, the biodiversity of the islands at the edge and, uh, and learn a little bit about that. Another uh, phrase used for, the, for Haida Gwaii is the Galapagos of Canada um, to do with their endemic species. Um, and we'll we'll dive into that as well. And then at the end, I'm gonna share with you some personal reflections of the place um, when I when I was able to go there back in 2021, and I certainly will want to go back again in the future. Um, I guess you know one thing I'm just going to share with you right off the bat with this picture is there's there's nowhere else in the world where I felt the colors, just the colors of the landscape, kind of the richness of the forest, the the depth of the color in the ocean, and the and kind of the the openness of the sky in conjunction with um, kind of the, the the abundance of wildlife and constant movement of animals and constant movement of tides in nature. It's, it's very beautiful. So um, I, I've tried to select some of my favorite pictures of the landscape and, and, and around, and uh, I hope you enjoy those as well. So we'll start with where is Haida Gwaii? Uh, if we're looking at North America, uh, we head over to the west coast of Canada, uh, British Columbia there, and we'll get a little bit closer. And you can see Vancouver Island, that's where I'm sitting now. That's the, the largest island on the west coast of North America. And then up to the northwest is Haida Gwaii. You can see uh, Masset and Dajing Eads there, also formerly known as uh, Queen Charlotte Islands and, the, and Queen Charlotte City uh, it was uh, Dajing Geeds, just, just renamed recently. Um, and we'll get a little bit closer here. And there we are, Haida Gwaii. So this is the area that we're going to be speaking about today. Um, the closest kind of major city 
on the mainland of North America is Prince Rupert, and that's across the Dixon Entrance or Hecate Strait, which is uh, also known as kind of one of the most challenging and difficult bodies of water to navigate any, anywhere on Earth. It's kind of it's in the top ten for being uh, notoriously rough and brutal. Um, so 40 to 140 kilometers from mainland uh, North America to the west of of Haida Gwaii, you have the open Pacific Ocean, and to the east, you have Hecate Strait. And it's about 120 miles long. Total land area is about 300 or 3,850 square miles. Now, for the purpose of this presentation, let's get a little bit closer. You can kind of see this. This here is the Parks Canada map. And uh, when I talk about Gwaii Hanas, um, Gwaii Hanas is down to the south. It's the area that's kind of outlined there. And that's the the, the National Park Reserve, the Marine Conservation Area, and Haida Heritage Site. And we will see this map again, and we'll, we'll get a little bit more intimate with some of the details of this map again. But that's to give you an idea of where Haida Gwaii is. So Haida Gwaii is an archipelago of over 160 islands. Um, on the west coast, it's basically exposed, um, brutal environment, very, very wet, um, very, very windy. It's the basically kind of the north or mid North Pacific. You've got the open uh, the open Pacific Ocean to the west, bringing in low pressure system after low pressure system after low pressure system and waves and storms and all that kind of stuff. And the land is known to be quite rugged and quite difficult and can be quite windy. Um, on the east coast, however, it's it's very different. You have basically all sorts of inlets and and coves and islands and lots of protection so it's actually a lot uh, a lot more manageable in particular for boats but um, there's there's lots and lots of coastline lots and lots of place to find protection uh, from the the more formidable west coast of, of Haida Gwaii. Um, the islands themselves are made up of a variety of things if you think about the formation of of Haida Gwaii uh, we're sitting at the edge of the North American plate and we've got the Pacific plate. The Pacific plate is subducting underneath um, the North American plate and is basically pushing up this ridge of rock, has done so for millions of years, and it's created um, the, the island chain that is uh, Haida Gwaii. Um, so with that, you have all sorts of things. There's an island that I popped out to in, uh, on one of the trips where there's, there's pillowy basalt where lava has formed kind of underneath um, the ocean, cooled very quickly. Um, underneath the sea and then you've also got like brilliant sandy beaches and then rock rocky rugged mountain ranges and there's there's sandstone there's slate there's uh, all sorts of different minerals and, and things it's a it's a great mixing point of uh, of geology as well so it's very interesting in that sense um, but then okay so let's go for what's in a name and this this one here folks it might help you recognize this um, a little bit more. Uh, the brief name for Haida Gwaii was Queen Charlotte Island. So Haida Gwaii, uh, or sorry, the Queen Charlotte Islands is what uh, what uh, the region was called on a map um, from you know the the late 1700s, early 1800s until 2010 is what it was on on chart. So a very kind of brief little glimpse into the actual history of the people of Haida Gwaii. The Haida have lived on the island since time immemorial, immemorial. Um, 10,000, 12,000 years is what some of the village sites have been dated back to. Um, and then also, if we go back to the, the end of the last ice age, the sea level was quite a bit lower. And there's some areas where they've, they've confirmed that there's kind of rock structure and, and, and whatnot below sea level um, where village sites would have been. Um, when the sea level was lower, even further back in time. So that's pretty pretty interesting to think about. But so the Haida have, have lived um, on Haida Gwaii for 12,000 years, and it was briefly called the Queen Charlotte Islands for about uh, 200 years until 2010 when it was officially renamed on, on maps and charts Haida Gwaii. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's known as, the Can as Canada's Galapagos. Um, another one is the Misty Isles, uh, a sheen of mist and and kind of the, that uh, that heavier ocean air is pretty common. Um, islands at the edge, that has to do with its position right at the edge of the continental plate. Um, and it's kind of the last 
the last kind of island chain on the western side of the North American uh, continental plate, at least in Canadian waters. And that's where we get Haida Gwaii. And Haida Gwaii in the Haida language means uh, the islands of the people. So who are the Haida uh, in general? And the, the Haida, as I was mentioning before, the original inhabitants of Haida Gwaii, they've lived there since time immemorial. Um, their traditional territory is the entirety of Haida Gwaii, as well as um, some parts of Southeast Alaska in the Panhandle. Um, they have some communities and they regularly traded and, and shared uh, resources with, uh, with other villages that were in the Alaska Panhandle. Um, that's pretty interesting. And throughout the, the archipelago of islands, there was historically tens of thousands of Haida. And if we if we talk about village sites in particular, like each village site, so this this image that I'm showing you on the screen here, this is at um, at Skadans or Kuna village, uh, which is one of the first villages as you make your way um, towards Guayhanas National Park Reserve and Haida Heritage Site. Um, but this is a house pit, um, which you would have been covered with massive red cedar logs big posts at each corner with with massive you know 60 to 80 foot um, cedar beams spanning that and then uh, split cedar shingles it, it would have been quite uh, quite an extraordinary um, house this is this is a chief's um, longhouse uh, so one of the larger ones um, but it could have easily slept you know 30 people 40 people and so each of the the village sites that are within Guayhanas um, could have supported you know around 200 to 500 people um, which is kind of where the idea that there was likely tens of thousands of Haida throughout um, Haida Gwaii. Um, so they're the people that that live there. I'm going to share another slide with you. Um, uh, this is from Skung Gwaii which is the most southerly village um, in, in Guayhanas and on Haida Gwaii. Um, but there's dozens of villages uh, or village sites throughout uh, the the uh, the islands um, during basically European contact was in the late 1700s but you may have heard this before with with some other um, with other First Nations groups and uh, throughout North America um, is that European uh, contact or, or kind of European diseases rather um, such as smallpox typhoid and measles um, ran rampant through the region and it was in the late 1860s early 1970s when Haida Gwaii um, got hit with smallpox, typhoid, and measles. Um, and what ended up happening is about nine, over 90% of the population perished in a very short period of time. Um, over 90% of the Haida. Uh, so, you know, in a village of 200 people, there might have been 20 people left, um, which is, you know, something to kind of try to put into your, put in, Put into perspective as to why they decided to leave uh, their villages um, but essentially by the the kind of mid 1880s 188 just after 1880 there was only about 600 Haida left um, they abandoned the southern villages and they all decided to go um, into kind of more central uh, villages to the north where there could be with more people um, access to, to better um, care and then that's also where um, vessels from the mainland would often be coming in and out so it was kind of a, a move that they made in the in the late 1800s to to do that. Um, yeah, the Haida uh, on the BC coast were also known to be they, they're they're very well well respected by other nations along the coast and in some cases feared. Um, they were regularly trading uh, with the mainland, so being on an island archipelago, you're kind of limited with what resources you do have, um, but you can you can trade goods uh, onto the mainland for different minerals and and supplies and food sources, uh, one of them being like the Ulican grease or Ulican fish, which is a, uh, a very important cultural um, uh, fish product uh, that, that was created or that has been important to First Nations in British Columbia for, for millennia. Um, and they're known as expert seafarers. If you think about their location, they're you know 40 to 140 kilometers away from the next nearest landmass. And so uh, in their dugout canoes uh, made of gigantic red cedar trees, they'd have to traverse. Um, they'd have to they'd have to navigate their way across 40 kilometers of some of the the most difficult um, kind of waterways in all of North America, and if not the world. And and this is something they were doing regularly. Um, they were going to mainland 
going to the mainland to for for trading missions and then they were also um following down the bc coast and and all the way down to kind of the puget sound region uh, which is somewhere around 800 miles um they were following all the way down there or following the coast and, and kind of trading and in some instances raiding and that kind of stuff as well um all the way down that far south so they were they're well known up and down the, the entirety of the the west coast of of canada um of british columbia that region and also in the the states as well um so during the the 1800s um in particular kind of right around the the 1860s there was the, the haida were all the way down in victoria um making regular kind of trading trading missions down to Victoria, British Columbia, which is amazing. So they're expert navigators and seafarers. Um, this is uh, an artist's depiction of what, based on kind of the footprint of, of remaining um, kind of Haida house pits and mortuary and, uh, and uh, family poles, memorial poles. Um, this is kind of the, the outlay of what they thought uh, Skongwai would look like, would have looked like. And you can see that, you know, one of the aspects of, of um, a Haida village is it's, it's going to have a good beach where you can bring in those, those long dugout canoes, bring them up the shore, and then also have room for, for multiple house pits. Each house would have a family living in it. Um, and again, like I was saying, kind of 20 to 40 people could live in each house and you have 15 to 20 houses, you get, you know, two to 500 people living in each, in each village site. Um, the Haida were are known as talented builders, carvers, and artists. And some of the the art um, that they created um, in their villages, you know, it would be kind of in the form of a, a Haida totem pole or a family pole, carrying family crests. Each pole, um, in particular, the ones that um, that that have multiple figures kind of working their way up. Each pole is it's basically telling a story um, and there's family crests that belong to each uh, each family, and and basically there's there's certain stories that they're allowed to tell, and these carvings would depict the stories of their family, um, which uh, was in extremely important. You can kind of see some of the structure of um, of the longhouses there, just big uh, red cedar, um, split cedar uh, construction, very 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 well put together, very strong construction. Um, and so much so that some of the wood, like if you can imagine, you know, this is 1878 in Skidans or, or Kuna, um, nobody's property properly lived there um, in the way that they did traditionally since that time. Um, but there's still house beams, the house pit's still there, there's still poles um, that are standing, um, which make these areas kind of the, one, of the, one of the reasons why they're the most extraordinary place on earth to see anything like this. Um, so the Haida are known to be talented builders, carvers, and artists. Um, some of you may have heard of Bill Reed, um, just as there's, I mean, it, there, there are many uh, world-renowned um, Haida carvers and artists. Bill Reed, this is his uh, Spirit of Haida Gwaii, the Jade Canoe, which is in the Vancouver International Airport. So if you're coming to British Columbia through Vancouver, um, you may have an opportunity to see this, um, this particular carving. And so, there, there's an, a lot of, um, uh, yeah, there's not jade carvings as well as um, uh, I think it, argillite carvings, as well as the cedar carvings. They're all very important um, to the Haida people as they were, they are expert carvers and, and craftspeople. So today, um, Haida Gwaii, the, the population of the entirety of the archipelago of islands is about 4,500 to 5,000 people. Um, there's about a thousand uh, people in Dajin Gids, and then in Masset, 800 Skidigat, 800 Port Clements, 300, and Sandspit, 300. So they're, they're, the rest being kind of spread out in that way. About half the population um, of Haida Gwaii um, is of Haida descent. Uh, whereas the other, there's there's still industry, there's business, there's all sorts of stuff going on on Haida Gwaii. There's, and uh, and people move there to make their home. There's BC Ferry, there's a regular BC Ferry service um, from the mainland, which takes, well, if you're leaving Port Hardy, it takes two days um, to get to Haida Gwaii, but um, Port Hardy on Vancouver Island. But uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a bustling place. It's a it's a, 
and there's a lot of people that do make their home in, but more so um, on the the North Island, which is Graham Island, where where almost all of these uh, communities are, aside from Sandspit. The South Island um, is called Moresby Island, and as we kind of work our way through the presentation a bit more, we're going to talk more about um, the southern portion of Moresby Island, which is where uh, Guayhanas is. So when we talk about the the conservation of Haida Gwaii, it wasn't it wasn't so straightforward um, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, basically, when the Haida left their, their village sites there was the, and, and moved to the, the communities up north, um, there, it, there was nobody, there's, there were no people really living on the land and, and kind of laying claim to that area. And this brought in multiple forms of different industry. Um, logging. Uh, was is a big one that still persists today, but in definitely much more of a managed way. Um, another one was whaling. Of course, whaling happened all throughout the world and and through the 18 late 1800s and into the the mid 1900s, um, there was a lot of whaling going on out of out of Haida Gwaii and Rose Harbor down in the south. Um, there was also mining, uh, some mining going on um, as yeah as well as commercial fishing extractive basically all of the extractive industries that that uh, were were persistent in british columbia and in canada throughout that time were were coming to haida gwaii um, and there was there was kind of no there's no way to slow it down there's no way to really keep tabs on it no way to manage it um, without having people living kind of in the region and, and seeing what was going on and so um basically by the 1970s um, the Haida began to organize themselves. There were some inspirational people, um, leaders of the community that basically decided to, that, that wanted to um, kind of slow this down. There, there were logging plans revealed that the entirety of South Moresby Island or Moresby Island would have been logged out by 1996. We would have had no, no National Park Reserve and Haida Heritage Site. Um, some of the logging camps or some of the, the the places that they were pulling trees off of some of the islands were were you know the best place to to bring a boat in or the best place to access land which would have been the place of a traditional village site um or or something similar and so there was there was a, a lot of energy and a lot of a lot of people basically saying no we need to stop this we need to we need to take control of this as well the Haida when they left the village sites they never they never kind of um they never you know, gave the title away. And so they felt that a lot of this was happening um, without their permission and, and they wanted to basically regain control of the, the, the land and regain control of the decision making in their own territory, um, their own traditional territory. And so 1970s um, is when kind of organization, protests and litigation began um, uh, uh, kind of formally approaching the courts to to try to stop um, logging um, and it all kind of culminated around 1985 1986 and 1987 um, there was the the council of the Haida nation was formed um, which kind of was formally going to the government as the Haida nation and saying uh, the canadian government and the provincial government saying that this needs to stop we need to protect um, our lands um, and we need to you know, protect our heritage sites. Um, and this all kind of culminated because there was a little bit of deception between um, the British Columbia government and an agreement that they had made with the Haida Nation um, saying that they would stop logging and nothing, no more trees would be logged in, in this area until um, uh, basically an agreement was come, had, had come to be with the, with the land title dispute. Um, but, and so the Haida said, okay, great. And then what ended up happening is the government issued more logging permits and logging was meant to resume, um, all coming to a head at a place called Lyle Island um, or, or uh, Atli Gwai. Um, I'll refer to it as, as Lyle Island um, for the presentation. But um, at, at Lyle Island, basically, there was this agreement to stop logging. And, and then the government issued more logging permits and the loggers were, were coming back to begin cutting trees and had begun um, cutting some of these big old old growth forests, big old trees. Um, and it push came to shove and uh, basically the Haida 
created a, a, a permanent base at a place called Windy Bay. Um, and Windy Bay was kind of the staging point for the beginning of protests to basically block the road so that loggers couldn't drive through and they couldn't um, bring machinery and, and continue logging. Um, what this in, ended up doing is it, it was it made national news, it made national headlines, and it gained national support. And the indigenous land claims discussions um, that the Haida demanded um, were finally brought to federal courts. And so it's it's a much more complex situation than what I'm explaining, but um, essentially the the protests led to a, a whole variety of things and, and ongoing discussions that still 40 years later um, are still um, are still being worked on and still being improved upon. Um, but in 1986, the Haida Nation Council of the Haida Nation declared um, what we know as now as Guayanas as uh, as a Haida heritage site to protect those culturally important sites. Um, and then after the protests and after about a year of protests and 72 um, uh, Haida were arrested, some of them were charged. I, I do wanna mention as well that of the 72, the first to be arrested were, were Haida elders. They're well-respected individuals within the Haida community um, that's basically had said, you know what, like enough is enough. We need to, we need to stop this. And they, you know, these are, these are folks that are in their seventies and eighties and they decided to block, be the blockade and they were arrested and, and charged um, with, uh, with basically, I think it was an injunction that was filed by the logging company and they, they ended up doing that. So, so it was, it was quite, um, quite empowering and quite uh, motivational to the rest of the Haida people to continue um, this this protest or to to many of the the, the Haida to continue this protest and, and protect the area. So by 1987, two years on from the protest, the South Moresby Agreement is signed, and Guayanas as a national park reserve. It, they they basically say that um, the area will not have any further logging, and a decision won't be made until the Haida uh, the Haida Nation land title claims are settled. And then after after much more discussion, negotiation by 1993, the federal government, the provincial government and the council of the Haida Nation all came together and they've signed, well, sorry, this is actually an agreement just between the federal and, and, and the Haida. Um, they signed the Guayanas Agreement, which basically set the framework for what the Guayanas uh, National Park Reserve, National Marine Conservation Area Reserve and Haida Heritage Site is today. It was groundbreaking um, because I'll show you a little map here. Because this area um, was to be co-managed. There's the, the it was called the, the archipelago, uh, oh shucks, I forgot the full name of it. The archipelago group, um, management group was, was basically the, the group that was going to be two members from Parks Canada and two members from Haida Gwaii would be appointed to this board and they would make decisions for the park. So it was a co-managed site. So it wasn't just the federal government saying, this is how it's going to be. It's basically both Parks Canada and um, the Haida Nation deciding how this, how this land is conserved and protected. Um, so that's pretty exciting in my opinion. And so here's a, a bit of a closer look. Um, something important is you can see the, the symbol in the bottom right corner of the screen. Uh, bottom right corner of the screen, this is the uh, Haida Guardian Watchman symbol. Um, and so a lot of the sites that, that I was able to visit and that we visit on the, on the Natural Habitat Adventures trip too, um, they are uh, basically, there are uh, Haida Guardian Watchmen that live there uh, throughout the summer months. Um, and they are, they are the people that basically manage and, and keep track of everything that's going on. Um, in the area, they greet visitors um, and uh, they tell stories and they share with you the Haida heritage and the Haida history of these extremely important sites. So the Haida Guardian Watchmen, they're founded in the 1980s. I actually got to spend a week with Captain Gold. Um, he's the most interesting man. Um, and he, he canoed from Moresby Camp. So I'm just gonna go back here and you can see Moresby Camp up at the top, um, just to the lower right of the compass rose there. Um, so he paddled from Moresby Camp all the way down through the island chain um, to the furthest south um, spot that you can see there. 
um, which is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site, but that's called Skung Gwai. So he paddled all the way from, I'm just gonna get my high laser pointer, all the way from Moresby Camp here down through the islands. I'm not exactly sure what route he took. Um, and then he ended on this remote island in the last southern village of the Haida uh, to be inhabited, um, the Skungwai. Uh, and he ended up spending some time there and he ended up um, greeting visitors and essentially inspiring what is the modern day Haida Guardian Watchman. Um, and beyond that, also the Coastal Guardian Watchman, which is kind of um, this, a similar program where uh, indigenous, indigenous people from from communities along the coast basically are, are keeping tabs and monitoring what's going on within their traditional territories, um, as well as greeting visitors and, and uh, participating in research and, and whatnot within their, within their traditional territories. And so that was Captain Gold. He paddled all the way down there um, and, and basically inspired this. And so a big part of going to the village sites, these traditional village sites, is you're not just seeing kind of the the old house pits or 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 poles or or kind of um house beams and that kind of stuff that are left over there's there's somebody there who um who very well knows the history of the region and they share that with you um in an in-depth and person in personal way um and so yeah so this one here this is where skungwai is and we'll just talk about skungwai a little bit but um basically it was abandoned in the early 1880s it was that last southern village um, it is the greatest collection of still standing um, mortuary poles and, and house poles anywhere on earth um, it's a unesco world heritage site um, for that reason it is it is um, extremely culturally important um, for the haida um, and haida members of the haida nation will regularly travel down to Skungwai for the spiritual um, powers that that it holds for them. And there's there's ruins of the of original longhouses and there's the best collection of these standing poles anywhere on earth. And you know these these poles are not going to be there forever. Um, they are being reclaimed slowly one by one by nature and by the the power of of the Pacific Northwest. Um, but Built of cedar, carved and constructed incredibly strongly, um, they are they are still standing um, today. And so it's extremely it's an extremely powerful and rewarding experience to get to walk through um, Skunk Y. And here's a couple more pictures. This is actually Captain Gold, um, the founder of the Haida Watchman program, standing on the beach at Skunk Y, looking up at the site. A little bit of a close-up so you can see you know the poles are they're they're incredibly beautiful and and you it's kind of like this contrast between like a powerful the powerful haida art and and the meaning behind the poles as well as um, nature kind of slowly retaking uh, you can see with this little sitka spruce tree growing out of one of them so that's kind of the the haida heritage side of my presentation um, the next part that I want to talk about is the flora and fauna of the islands at the edge, the, the Misty Isles. So a couple of things you can see, you know, via the arrows on the screen, we've got the arrows coming from the, the bottom left there. They are flying at the west coast of Haida Gwaii. That's where you basically get a lot of kind of upwelling. Um, you can see the terrain of the, the continental shelf there. So Haida Gwaii is still on the North American plate, and then it drops right off um, to the Pacific plate there where that's subducting underneath the, the North American plate. Um, and what this does is it upwells a lot of the cooler deep ocean waters, creating a lot of mixing um, around the coast, providing a lot of nutrients. Um, also being an archipelago and having tidal fluctuations in the range of kind of 18 to 25 feet being as far north as it is, every six hours the tide can kind of rise and fall about that far. Um, the, the mixing and the oxygenation and the, the movement of water provides just the perfect settings for one of the most um, abundant, not only intertidal lives, but also um, abundant marine life uh, 
it's uh, yeah we'll we'll talk about it a little bit more but Haida Gwaii is is well known to be an important uh, feeding site in the summertime for humpback whales um there's off the off the coast you can get other species of whales as well but humpback whales uh lots of sea lions and uh, with sea lions and seals you also get orca um that's just the marine environment one and a half million breeding seabirds anyways i've got some slides on that stuff but something else that makes um, Haida Gwaii quite interesting, and this is something that's really been debated for a long time, um, you know, trying to model the the historic ice ages. Um, you know, the, the the Earth has kind of been going through about two and a half million years of these freeze, like ice age cycles with um, kind of interglacial periods that last, you know, 20 to 30,000 years, and then, a longer ice age from like 80 to 150,000 years followed by another inter interglacial period of 20 to 30,000 years. And so it's thought that because of Haida Gwaii's position at the edge of the continental plate during the last ice ages or the last several ice ages, um, Haida Gwaii may have had some um, ice on it, but it also may have been a, a refuge. So it may have had at least the mountain peaks poking out um, above the ice cap. But also something else interesting is to the, the east of Haida Gwaii, in between kind of Haida Gwaii and mainland North America, that the basin that is Hecate Strait, and one of the reasons why it is so rough, um, the basin that is Hecate Strait is extremely shallow. And so it's thought that sea levels could have been around 100 feet lower um, or more. Um, uh, during the last ice age, and it depends on where you are on Earth, during the last ice age and during an ice age, the, the sea level will drop as all the water is kind of brought up into the ice caps themselves. Um, and this would have exposed this kind of vast area in between Haida Gwaii and the mainland mountain ranges of the coast range. And so if, if Haida Gwaii was in fact covered with, as you can see, it's called the Charlotte's ice cap, but we should, you know, let's call it the Haida Gwaii ice cap. Um, there, there may have been lowlands in between Haida Gwaii and the, the mainland of North America that, that would have then been exposed and then been habitable and could have contained forests and much of, much of the, the plant life and that we would expect to see today. Because ice ages don't happen overnight, they happen over thousands of years, so of course plants, um, plants and animals and everything can kind of move with the changing environment into different areas, which may be part of the reason why um, uh, uh, Haida Gwaii is known as Canada's Galapagos. Um, so they have an extensive catalog of endemic species, animals that are found nowhere else on earth. Um, you know, they might look similar or endemic species or subspecies. Uh, one of them here, you can see in this, this picture, um, uh, this is the Haida Gwaii ermine. Uh, so a little, a little weasel with a black, uh, black tip. Um, this weasel is actually a combination of genes, which is, this is kind of uh, a little baffling as well. It's a combination of genes from uh, kind of Europe, um, Europe and Asia, and also North America. And so it's, it's kind of somewhere in the middle. You know, how it came to be is, is a great question. Um, but six of 10 of the native land mammals are endemic. Um, and that includes as well the uh, Haida Gwaii black bear, so the Haida Gwaii black bears, this is, this is an animal that comes down and feeds um, in particular at low tide. On, you can kind of see the intertidal life that this bear is walking through on, on mussels and barnacles and digging for maybe clams. Well, not, not so much digging, but mostly the mussels and barnacles, um, and they're crunching those up uh, with their teeth. So anyways, the way that they are different from mainland uh, black bears in North America is they have bigger heads bigger jaws, bigger, stronger jaws, and they are the largest average body size of any North American black bear. Um, beyond that, there's also exceptional endemism in mosses, flowering plants, beetles, fish, birds, mammals, you name it. Um, and there's nowhere else in Canada that has this many uh, endemic species in one place. So, um, you know, will, you, will we see all of those on a trip? That's a great question. Um, you, maybe your ex, if we see a, a Haida Gwaii black bear, that would probably be the most likely. Um, but also even like Stellar's jays um, and uh, uh, what's another one? The, um, oh shucks, it's slipping my mind. But Stellar's jays and other kind of 
more common birds that stay on Haida Gwaii year-round also are, are distinct subspecies and, and separate from the mainland populations. Um, this is a saw wet owl. Um, that's the Haida Gwaii saw wet owl, of course, and is darker in color than the mainland species. And then this last one here is uh, an endemic twin flower violet. Um, so there's a whole variety of endemic species. But endemic is, is one thing. Um, and then we also have kind of the biodiversity and abundance. So something that I've, that I, this is like a total highlight of, of any trip to Haida Gwaii is just the intertidal life. And the life that you can see, like if you go out in a kayak or in a, in a zodiac and you're kind of working your way along uh, some of these kind of little islets and coastal islets and areas where there's a significant amount of current rushing through, um, this is definitely something like, we, we did it on both of my trips many times. Um, just the, you know, you look at the forest above the water and it's kind of green and mossy and all that kind of stuff. And that's that's wonderful. But below the ocean surface with this kind of extremely productive marine ecosystem, um, you get such an extraordinary abundance of marine species. And we're talking like sea stars um, of all varieties of colors, anemones, um, in this picture here, I just, I, I tried to find pictures of this kind of stuff, but in, in all honesty, when I was there, I was driving the boat. And so I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't take too many pictures of the intertidal stuff um, as I wanted to keep everyone safe and, and drive. But um, the intertidal stuff, just to like, my memory serves me right. It's, it, it's, it is extraordinarily just explosive with life. I mean, even in this, the picture on the left there, if you look at the bottom, you can see Kind of the horizontal and vertical shapes those are all sea cucumbers the darker shapes those are all sea urchins and this is just you know i i've never seen so many sea cucumbers in one spot um, in my entire life i've seen lots of urchins but i've never seen so many sea cucumbers that, that were just sitting together in one spot in crystal clear water it's just like the the density and the abundance of these animals um, in the intertidal zone is is really cool um, the picture on the right there, those are northern abalone, um, declared endangered because of, uh, of many, many years of over-harvesting. Um, but there are definitely stronghold populations throughout the coast of British Columbia, and Haida Gwaii is one of them. Um, lots and lots of northern abalone up and down. Um, we've got scallops and sea stars and mussels and barnacles and anemones and nudibranchs. And like it's just an explosion of color and life. Um, uh, beneath the surface of the ocean and, and definitely a highlight there. Um, beyond that, in the forest, the terrestrial life, the forests of, of Haida Gwaii are just, uh, the forests of, of Gwaii Hanas, the places that we, we are able to go off and, and look and kind of, these are typically around the Haida heritage sites. They are, they are extremely special. The moss is something I remember. Um, really, really just kind of like lush, thick blankets of moss throughout the forest. The trees, this this is a gigantic Sitka spruce tree um, that was in Windy Bay. And, you know, you're walking past trees that are like six to 10 feet wide. And then you get to this one and it's like, I can't remember exactly how many people it, it was to put our arms around this, but it's like this this tree, you know, is going to be 250 to 300 feet tall. And the the girth of it the 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 width is probably somewhere around I, I would say let's say the circumference is probably around 60 to 70 feet something like that but it's it was just like this gigantic sitka spruce tree and this is what um what when it comes to kind of the forest and that kind of thing this is what the Haida nation was wanting to protect uh from the terrestrial biodiversity was these big old beautiful trees um, that if, you know, a tree like this is going to be 800 to 1200 years old, um, been there a lot longer than any of us. And they, that's what they, they wanted to save and protect. So the terrestrial experience is, is really beautiful. Another really interesting feature of some of the, 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 the stops that we make on land is the potential to see what are called culturally modified trees. And so the, the Haida um, used cedar. Um, in particular, red cedar. Um, they called it the tree of life. And the red cedar, um, basically, you can, uh, the, the hider were able to, to pull bark off to do all sorts of weaving. 
Um, they're extraordinarily, uh, the Haida are also renowned as extraordinarily talented weavers, not just of cedar, um, but of lots of other trees as well. But cedar was definitely a, the main one for kind of like the larger clothing pieces and blankets and hats and waterproof material. They could weave it so tight that water would not uh, permeate. Um, so they could pull bark off of the, the cedar trees for that. They could um, harvest live planks of wood from living trees. Um, there's kind of remnants in some areas where they've done a little uh, a sample of the tree because to select a cedar tree for a canoe um, or for or, or something like that, you have to basically do a test to see if the grain of the wood is good, to see if it's hollow. If it's hollow, it's no good, um, that kind of thing. So there's, there's like these 200, 300 year old um, uh, kind of remnants of, of, of the highest usage of the forest um, in, in many places as well, which is really, really fascinating to me. As well, um, I mean, yeah, I was already kind of talking about the biodiversity and the abundance of life and the mixture and what makes kind of this the perfect habitat for all sorts of animals. In this picture, you can see some stellar sea lions that are hauled out on an islet. There's lots of stellar sea lions that were around, but aside from the extraordinary intertidal and marine life, um, it's got over 1.5 million nesting seabirds. Some of the highlights for seabirds um, are definitely uh, rhinoceros auklets. I'll just show you a picture here. Rhinoceros auklet here with uh, some sand lance in its mouth. Um, tufted and horned puffins. Um, ancient murelets, if we're lucky. Uh, as well, there's potentially like black guillemots, common mures, bald eagles. Um, there's, I mean, we'd be extremely lucky if we got to see one, but there's an endemic species of goshawk, the northern goshawk um, uh, on Haida Gwaii, as well as uh, I think it's the, the perils. Oh gosh, what is it? There's a, there's a specific raptor as well um, that, that's there as well, and maybe some osprey. But the 1.5 million nesting seabirds. Um, they're all of the little islets all around are ideal for puffins. And then the rhinoceros auklets are burrowers um, and they, they burrow in some of the, some of the sites around. And, and that's, that's a big part of the, um, the, the Haida watchmen as well. Their job is to kind of protect and make sure people don't go wandering off and just go stick their foot through um, a rhinoceros auklet burrow or something along those lines. So um, I, I met uh, a long time, uh, Guayanas Park Ranger, who has who spent a lot of his career monitoring and and uh, and kind of keeping tabs on the uh, extremely high seabird population of Haida Gwaii. As well, twenty species twenty species of cetacean, including humpback whales, monkey whales. We've also got sea lions, seals, harbor seals, um, and orcas. There, they are around. Um, it just you know you never know which you're gonna see when you're out there. A couple more pictures, some orcas. We were, we were sailing um, around uh, up, up basically a little inlet and we, we caught, uh, caught sight of these three orca. There was more than three orca. There was a pod of, um, of Biggs orca or transient orca. And we followed them for about an hour and we parted ways after they had arrived at, um, at a seal hollow and they basically disappeared right before the seal hollow and then all showed up and like a whole bunch of seals got scared into the water and we suspect due to the change of the color of the water that one of the seals didn't make it out um, but you know the, it's it's an extremely wild place and and it's it's, it's it's yeah it's bustling with wildlife everywhere you go um yeah, more pictures, old growth forest, nice beach and an old growth forest. I'm just gonna share some nice pictures with you from my time there. Some of the intertidal life, look at those big anemones in this tidal pool. Some stellar sea lions curious about what's going on. And just a, a beautiful sunrise uh, at one of our anchorages. And that that brings me kind of to one of my 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 favorite parts about exploring Haida Gwaii. You know, Haida Gwaii is uh, it's a national park reserve, Haida heritage site, marine conservation area, for all the reasons that I've just discussed. And the only way, and the best way to explore, um, the only way you can really explore um, Gwaii Hanas and Haida Gwaii is by boat. 
Um, the North Island, where where the communities are, where the the towns are, there's there's roads you can travel in between. There's provincial parks. There's um, there's um, there's regional parks, that kind of stuff. Haida heritage sites up there as well. Um, but to get down into kind of this richness, um, you need to go south, and you need to go into Guayanas National Park Reserve, Marine Conservation Area, and Haida Heritage Site. You need to go down there, and the way to do that is absolutely by expedition boat, expedition sailboat. Um, so the the vessel pictured in these uh, in, in my shots here, this is the the island solitude. Um, and the island solitude, I, I was working as first mate um, on board the island solitude for for the summer. And you know, the the ability to get into these remote areas and the ability for a vessel like this to just the captain and you know your expedition leader will basically like look at the chart, look at the weather, look at the day and be like, you know what? I think sunset's gonna be really, really beautiful over in this anchorage. And you know, you'll be sitting there on board with a with a chef on board who's preparing extraordinary meals for us, you know, three times a day, snacks, all that kind of stuff, keeping us well fueled for our adventure. Um, and you know, you you very much are one of very few people that are in this entire region. Um, you'll pop into an anchorage, sit there for the evening, let the sun set. Um, you can hang out on the deck of the boat, um, looking around. Uh, maybe we can pop the kayaks off the roof of the, roof of the boat, and if you want to go for a little paddle around, you can go for a paddle around. Or maybe we've already planned it, and we're going to get out of the zodiac, get into the zodiacs, and go for a little exploration and and see what's going on in the intertidal life or something like that. It is it is absolutely the coolest way um, to to become involved with this environment and with this landscape. Um, so yeah, expedition sailboats, extraordinary crew, like the the crews that I was working with. Um, you know, your your expedition leader and the crew that you're working with. These are people who have who have spent numerous hours. New, or not numerous hours, numerous days, weeks, and months um, operating on the on the British Columbia coast um, and in Haida Gwaii as well, and they have an intimate knowledge of of where where we need to go and where we need to be to get the best possible experience. Um, and so they can they 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 know what what needs to happen. They know where we how how we're going to get the most out of an experience and. Um, I would I'd say that having the opportunity to have worked with them um, over the last several years and worked with pretty much all of the captains of these vessels, um, they're some of the most wonderful um, people that that I've ever met. And so they're they're really going to take good care of us and uh, and and work well with your expedition leader to make sure that you're having uh, an extraordinary time. Um, the two vessels that are going to be used uh, for this year, I think they're the Island Solitude and the Island Odyssey. And they are both like these these sailboats, you know, it's not designed for just a few people. They are they are designed as expedition adventure sailboats. And they're they're set up that way so that we can we can basically go and do what we need to do and have the most miraculous experience. It's perfect, the perfect platform. And um yeah, so this kind of brings me to the end of my presentation, everybody. But what I would like to share with you is kind of my my personal feelings and reflections from from Haida Gwaii. Um, having grown up in Canada, having grown up on Vancouver Island, you know, not too far away from from Haida Gwaii, it was always a place that was kind of uh, revered by by uh, kind of leaders and leaders in my community and role models that I had and, you know, people in Canada, people in British Columbia, people within the coast, you know, everybody's kind of like, oh, have you ever been to Haida Gwaii? And it's always kind of been this, this destination that, that is, is like out, just out of reach. You know, the, it takes two days to take a ferry to Haida Gwaii. And then you need to find your way around um, Haida Gwaii as well. If you take the, take your, Vehicle, you can do that, but you can. You're still restricted um, to to the North Island um, and a, just a touch of the South Island. But Gwai Hanas and operating on these sailboats enabled me to um, basically get into a part of the world that is so special um, and so unique in such a way that I will never ever forget my journeys there. And I am definitely 
trying to go back. Um, I I could spend a lot more time than I have there. Uh, other things that I that I recognized, I remember there was this one evening where I had we had kind of like finished up dinner, and you know this was in June. It was I'd finished up dinner, and I decided, you know what, I think I'm just going to go sit on the bow of the boat. Sun was setting. It was about 10 o'clock, and you know everything's kind of calming down. The 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 cove that we had anchored in was like completely flat calm. The generator on the sailboat's off. There's there's no sounds coming from us except for you know the odd shuffling um, down below deck, and I'm just laying there, like in this extremely pristine wilderness, looking out at kind of acres and acres and acres of old growth, pristine forest as far as I can see. And the only sound that I can hear is you know the the rippling of of water against the bow of the boat and the melodic call of hermit thrushes and more hermit thrushes than I had ever heard in one place, um, just making their their gentle calls off into the off into nature. And you know that that alone, um, that memory will stick with me. And I I think that uh, Haida Gwaii is often said to have special powers um, or it's often said to kind of carry a special energy. And I absolutely agree with that after having spent uh, some time there. So thank you very much. And that's my daily dose of nature. Eddie, thank you so much for that presentation. I'm completely sold. I'm going to meet you up there. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> and from the comments, I think there's a lot of other folks who are itching to go up there too. We've got a lot cool. of questions. So I'm going to do kind of a rapid fire, see if we can't get through a bunch of them kind of quick. Um, Let's do did it. You, did you mention what guai means? Uh, guai in general, guai hanas um, or haida guai basically is is islands. islands. So Haida Gwaii is islands of the people. Um, Gwaii Hanas is islands of beauty. Mm. That's That sounds appropriate. Um, there's a spirit of Haida Gwaii sculpture in front of the Canadian embassy in DC. Do you know if that's a copy yes. or if that's something that was taken from the Haida Gwaii area? So if there's a, that's, that sculpture, that's at the Canadian Embassy. I'm fairly certain that that was carved by Bill Reed for that purpose. Okay. Um, do you know if the Haida Gwaii people were impacted by the Canadian policy to remove Indigenous children from their um, families to educate them in schools away from their communities? The residential school system? Yes, they were. Okay. Um, Let's see. Also a question about possibly some of the Haida Gwaii art being in the San Francisco Bay Area. And is there There's, any effort to reclaim any of the, the Haida art outside of Canada? It's a good question. There, there likely is. Um, there's, there's likely Haida art all over the world. And it's one of those things that it takes time to, to bring back. And I'm, I'm positive if it's known about, there's a discussion that's been ongoing about where that that piece of art needs to be. Hmm. Do you know if um, the Haida, it's the Haida view to let the poles naturally decompose or is there an effort to preserve them? There, so within the Haida heritage sites, there's kind of minimal um, kind of assistance left to the poles. A, a part of a pole is it's not supposed to last forever. Um, and so there's, a, there's essentially a story and a lesson within having those poles degrade. Um, and, and so yes, some there, there's, there's Haida poles that were taken from, let's say Skong Gwai, um, and some like Masset and Skidigit, there, and they have been preserved as best they can. There's the, the Haida Heritage Center um, that's uh, kind of in, in one of the communities up north. And the Haida Heritage Center, I believe, has a few preserved poles, um, but the ones that are at the village sites they are they are going to be reclaimed by the land, and that is that is important. Um, it, it's an important thing to recognize that that that's totally okay. Mm. Um, do the Haida know where their ancestors came from, or have any, you know, have you heard any stories about that path? Um, there's there have been uh, discussions, and where their ancestors came from is. 
you know, there, there's a number of different theories about kind of the colonization of, of North America by um, uh, First First Nations people. Um, but I, I can't say specifically for Haida Gwaii. Like I've, I've heard multiple stories, like there's, there's um, the discussion that even in between like interglacial periods, there could have been people on Haida Gwaii um, that, that lived through the ice age in kind of the, the glacial refugia. Um, mm-hmm. uh, a gentleman I was talking to was suggesting that uh, there could have been people living there as long as 30,000 years ago. But the, the general kind of uh, discussion is that there was a migration across the Bering Land Bridge um, kind of prior or post the last ice age or right around kind of 12 to 14,000 years ago, hmm. um, being kind of in line with, with people living there about 12,000 years ago. But I, I'd have to do further research to have a, a really, really good handle on exactly how people got to Haida Gwaii. Okay. Um, is it a seismically active area? Are there earthquakes? It is. There's even hot springs. Um, there's uh, a place called Hot Springs Island where um, in 2000, I think it was 2012, there was an earthquake um, and the earthquake occurred and the hot springs stopped working. Um, they got cold, but they're hot again now. So that's good. And that's probably one of the places that not have will go. But uh, yeah, it's, um, it is seismically active. Yeah. Mm. Ring How of fire. Cold? How cold is the water? Would there be any snorkeling activities involved on this trip? Um, you know, snorkeling, I I didn't see it happen on, on my trip. We did go swimming um, a couple times, but we just jumped off the sailboat and went swimming. Um, so I would say it could potentially happen, but it is the North Pacific and warm water is uh, hard to come by. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that's the last question we have time for today. Thank you for your quick fire responses. Um, but there's yeah. lots more questions and clearly an interest in you doing a NADHAB specific, um, you know, NADHAB trip specific, know before you need to go um, webinar. So hopefully we can put that on the schedule sometime soon um but sure. what an amazing place and i just want to thank our our viewers for their brilliant questions i mean you guys always um come up with some wonderful wonderful discussion points and i wish we had more time to go over them so hopefully we'll get get some more time down the road um but i'll turn it back to you for closing comments yeah i mean thank you everybody i will definitely look into doing a follow up presentation in the coming weeks um, Haida Gwaii, like that's that was probably the hardest thing uh, about this presentation was trying to condense it into 45 minutes because I just want to talk about it for hours. It's such a spectacular place. Um, but yeah, thank you so much and uh, enjoy your afternoon. Well, even saying Haida Gwaii just has a it has a feeling to it that is um, I don't know what how to, how to describe it, but when I heard that word or heard those words, it was like that's mysterious and interesting and um, otherworldly. So um, thank you for letting us take that trip with you today. Um, I want to thank everybody who tuned in. Please join us again tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the, the replay available on our website soon. With that, I'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone.